Welcome to the Law School Insider, where we have conversations with students, lawyers, and employers. Succeeding in law school is something that you must prepare for, not only before you begin, but throughout your law school journey, and that's what this podcast is all about. I am your host, Dr. Christopher Lewis, and I will draw from my over 20 years of experience in the college admission field, as well as bring forth the experiences of others as we delve deeper into the issues. everyone. Welcome back to the Law School Insider. I'm your host, Dr. Christopher Lewis, and I'm so excited to be able to have you back again this week. This week, I have the pleasure of being able to speak with Michigan State Representative Peter Lucido. He represents Macomb County in the 36th District, and it is always a pleasure to be able to talk to our state representatives and talk to people in public service to be able to see how they're using that JD degree to help all of you and their constituents, but also to get a better perspective on their journey into what they're doing today. So, Peter, thanks so much for joining us this week. My pleasure. I appreciate that. And I appreciate the fact that I have been given a great gift, and that is having a law degree, because that opens immense amount of doors and opportunities for the students who then become lawyers or who then become business owners, who then become people that work in a profession that they can serve that profession much better because of their depth, skills, and knowledge they've learned in law school. So one of the things that I like to do in this show is turn the clock back in time. And I know that you attended Detroit College of Law a while back and were able to have a great opportunity to be able to to have that experience of going through law school. But even before that, there was something about the law that that inspired you to to go through the law school experience and become a lawyer yourself. Talk to me about that genesis and talk to me about how you decided that the law was right for you and what brought you to deciding to go to law school in the first place. Well, you know, about 10 years old, I, you know, I had a a gift of gab, as they say. And what happened was uh, you you get, you know, familiar with your comfort zones of life of what you feel comfortable doing. And I always like to talk. I mean, uh, my grandmother used to say, and she passed away when I, she was 96, you know, someday he's going to be an avogado. And in, in Italian, avogado means a, a lawyer. He's going to be a lawyer. So it kind of stuck with me then when I was 10. Uh, when I got into eighth grade, I think that's about 13, 14, one of the government teachers there, Joe Good, his name is, he's still alive. And, and he said to me, you know, you'd be a big advocate in the legal profession. And I said, you know, that's my course or that's my direction. By the time I finished college, it was pretty obvious that this was going to be my career path. And what I did, I made application at the time for some law schools and got accepted. I kind of had the fit with DCL at night, Detroit College of Law, which is now center field of Comerica Park. And, you know, it did what it did for me because it's not only in time constraints, but also in, you know, how I could move around the city, get acclimated to do what lawyers do. And that was become a law clerk and then work in the public defender's office, which lent itself then to doing probation work, and all those culminations of experiences helped me in private practice when I finally opened my own shop. So those things that I've learned and experiences that I took advantage of, and I'm going to tell any law student, you know, you've got summers where you can take courses, that's great, but you can also learn to get some experience about things that you may find interest you to see if this is going to be your long-term career path. You may find you hate it. Uh, you know, I wanted to be a real estate lawyer and do all of these big shopping malls and everything else. But after doing a couple of small lease agreements in private practice, I found out this ain't for me. This isn't exciting. This isn't what I want. So, I mean, doing criminal work and trial work, doing domestic work and, and, and arguing motions and going to court. That's what my life was. And what got me there was all the little nuances that I did, you know, from pumping gas, delivering papers, working in a pizzeria cleaning malls, all those things you do and experiences that you do help you to become that much more in tune with what it is that you do as far as the public, because these are the people that I serve. So it was a perfect fit when somebody came in and said, look, you don't know what an auto mechanic does. And I said, yes, I do. I went to school at night while I was in high school and I took auto mechanics. And I know what you mean about fixing brakes or transmissions or tune-ups and whatnot. And it kind of connected with the customers that I serve, the clients that we call them, which even broadens my skills because knowing what they go through, I can live 
somewhat through them and say, I know how tough it is that they get up every day, do the work that they do. I got to go back and I got to serve them the best I can. And having that uh, mom and pa type setting helped me to develop my practice even better because I knew what it was and the needs that they had to fulfill. I, I tell you, there's so much good that a lawyer can do today. It doesn't matter if they practice. It does matter, though, being able to influence policy that's been changing things in the state. I'm forever grateful because my law school career really shaped and, and gave me a firm foundation. Stability is the best thing that made me very confident in the role that I'm playing today as a legislator. Now, in developing that confidence for yourself, not every person that goes into law school has that confidence. And you have to gain that along the way if you don't have it coming in. What are some of the steps that you did to solidify the confidence that either you had at the beginning or that you had at the end or even further on in your career that people can start working on today that could help them to become more confident in the skills that they have and that they're learning as they become a lawyer? I think it comes from, first of all, the, the intimate relationships that you have with your professors in law school, and I'll tell you why. A lot of the professors would say someday – you are going to be there by yourself and that client's going to come in and they're going to pay you money to fix a problem, to take care of a, a need that they have. And first of all, you have to understand what the problem is, the nature of it. So you've got to be a good listener. That's the first thing. You have to understand what it is they're coming in for and what you need to redress. Two, you have to understand what or, where to look for solutions or options or alternatives. Okay, a lawyer that doesn't have a solution, an option or alternative is not a lawyer. So I'm, I'm being very candid and specific to say, if you're not going to be able to redress and give somebody at least a soothing alternative option, a, something to get rid of their problem, then that's not the good business for you because that's what lawyers do. And sometimes there is none. And sometimes the answer is, you're going to get stuck in this one because the law doesn't provide a remedy. And the last thing that I saw through law school was taking advantage of the opportunities I spoke about earlier, going into the public or the businesses or the private sector, public sector, government sector, take advantage of those experiences. I've had people in law school that said they want to come and work in the legislature. By all means, please do. Learn how laws are made because you're going to be masters of your craft when you get done because you'll see it's not perfect what goes on up here, but it is part of the process of how we put together and assemble a law that ultimately is going to have to be either followed by the, the, the citizens or two, enforced by the courts or three, brought to at least an argument by the lawyers. So, you know, these branches of government that we have, judiciary and legislative and executive, all of them take part in this process and testimony is taken in committees. So when you say, how do we better equip ourselves to go ahead and build confidence, take advantage of all those experiences, you'll find your niche, you'll find your comfort zone or your sweet spot, which will build your self-esteem as well as your own confidence inside, hey, I'm good at what I do, I'm going to get better. And that's what came about. I loved the mom and pa practice of law, and I keep saying that because my law firm, when I started, was me and another lawyer that I went to law school with. It built on to 11 lawyers and, you know, 13 support staff. I got to tell you, when the day was done with, we built, you know, a pretty big empire over there in regards to what a small law firm was. And, and at the same time, we loved the challenges every day of people coming in with problems and giving them solutions or finding alternatives and being problem solvers. And that's what made my life more meaningful and more enjoyable and more importantly, gave me a sense of pride and accomplishment. I appreciate you sharing that. Now, as you think back on your law school experience, all the experiences you had in law school, and as you went into your career and you, you've worked in private practice, now you're working as a state representative, are there things that if you look back now, that you wish you would have either done, accomplished, or finished up for yourself in law school that you may not have originally, that would have helped you to find success sooner? 
Chris, it was like a succession plan. I'll be honest with you. If you look at it this way, you, you know, you get out of undergrad when you're in your like mid twenties, and then you go through law school and you're out and you take the bar and then you become a lawyer and you're like, you know, late twenties, early thirties. Okay. For those late bloomers, early bloomers or bloomers that said, you know, I'm going to hang around and get a master's degree like I did. You know, I went a little extra and got an MBA, but let me tell you, when you say, was there anything that I regret or would have changed or did differently to help build a, 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 you know, a better, brighter future? No, the reason is, is this, I knew that you get three feet basically of a tape measure and the first 12 inches or foot you're going to be building to go get all the tools you can. All those tools are going to be necessary for you to build your career, which means I'm going to go to school, either trade school, or I'm going to go, in this case, law school, and get all the tools that I need, undergrad, graduate, and law degree. In addition, I got some licenses along the way, which was my securities for stocks and bonds, my insurance license, my real estate license. You know, I even went to get an auto mechanics license. Those things are huge as far as being able to understand the legal jargon, to understand the requirements, to understand what the responsibilities and duties are. From that point on, I wanted then the next 12 inches of the tape measure. I wanted to build as much as I could, work as hard as I could, raise my family, and, and you know just work as hard as I could to put away for my future. That was the second 12 inches or second foot. The last 12 is now. I've gained all that experience and knowledge of working with my clients. I went into court and argued the law, got into legal discussions and bantering with judges as it related to, if you don't like the law, Lacito, go change it. Well, that's what I'm doing now. There were many times where the law did not work for those individuals in my, you know, that I served as, as a lawyer. And many times that I asked the judge to do equity you know, because they had the equitable powers in circuit court. And a lot of times the judges would look at me and said, look, I have to follow the law and I'm going to follow the law because that's what I'm instructed to do as a judge. And therefore, I'm going to carry out the law as it's written and therefore go change the law if you don't like it. Those same judges I'm calling up to the legislature now asking them when I put a transcript in front of them, do you remember this? Do you remember how it did not help and it did not give what's called a remedy to the client that I served. Yes. Would you help me now change the law so there's a remedy for these clients? And I've called up a half a dozen judges to testify so that they would be able to reshape and to re-engage to do the right thing and make the law better for the people that it's supposed to serve. In addition, I want the young lawyers or the soon-to-be, the candidates for the bar exam and, and, and soon-to-be graduating and everything to understand there's a great way of, of learning the law in the legislature because you're putting together the law, so you're studying the law in a new facet, which is how do those statutes really work when put into practice in a courtroom? How does it work? Because when they don't work, everybody gets mad at the legislature the way they went ahead and formulated this language, these tools, because our, our, our tools are our words is what it is. And they're stock and trade, as Lincoln said. Therefore, if you look at it, you have to have good language that has meaningful results. And that's what I'm doing. And that's the last tape part of the tape measure is to give back all of the experience for 30 years as a practicing lawyer, all the trials and tribulations and woes and difficulties and griefs and observations, I'm bringing it back full circle to those same clients now, but they're called constituents, to give it back and say, let me reshape, let me bring these bills that I think will now modify or codify things, making it easier for people to have legal access to the, to the system that's supposed to serve them. That's the best fruit I can give to the, the students. That's the best, best way I can tell them this is the, what you can do. You don't need, necessarily need a, a specific career, but if you're going to make the legislature a part of your career, I'd love to see lawyers come up to the legislature. I'd even like to see more if the law students wanted to be interns or you know, be a part of the legislature in regards to policy and shaping the world. That's what you do up here. You're shaping your state as far as the policy is concerned.
Now, with the background that you had and the many years of professional practice that you had prior to entering uh, the state representative role, what was it about the role itself that called you? And Here's the calling. The, the, yeah. the, the calling was this. After 30 years of being in the business, it's no different from a police officer, a fireman, some of the school teachers and whatnot. You know you're still good. You know you still got tread on your tire and you still want to roll. And you still got the exuberance that you probably didn't even know you had when you took a second breath and said, I can make a career change, give back all of what was given to me from my clients, from the court system, from the judges, from the prosecutors, from the police, et cetera, et cetera, down the line and give it back on the knowledge and the skill that I've learned in my trade and now make the world here in Michigan a better place by going ahead and giving back. I mean, it is a journey up here living in a hotel and making the run from, you know, Macomb County up to Lansing. And, you know, it's not easy, but again, this is the dues that you pay to say, I want to pay it back. I want to pay it forward. Let's face it. Lawyers should be very, very ecstatic, but at the same time, very humble that they have that degree and that knowledge and that experience. And the reason why is it's not all of us that are, can be capable of doing that a massive amount of reading, regurgitating, and bringing it back on a bar exam and all that other stuff that goes along with the legal skill and training. Same with doctors. And, say, and what you can do is you can give yourself a pat on the back. You can go ahead and, you know, be blessed from the fruits that you actually received, make a career out of it, and then give back. So that's what it's all about. I mean, lawyers should be great stewards, not good, great stewards of the law and give back that stewardship that you've earned while you got your degree and that you went ahead and professed when you were in the profession. Give it back. That's what brought me to Lansing. That's what brought me here to be a legislator. And we don't have enough lawyers in the legislature. There's 110 House members, 38 senators, that's 148 total, and we have a dozen lawyers between the House and the Senate. So, you know, that's a minority, a, a very small minority. I'd like to see that where judges, prosecutors, business lawyers, anyone that has this law degree come full circle and come up to Lansing and be a part of shaping and re-energize yourself, engage yourself with the legislative process and help out because it's, we need a lot of help. We do. Now, if someone truly wanted to move in that direction, to start taking that, that role of giving back and helping at that state level, whether it be in Michigan or any other place, what would you say are some pieces of advice for someone that is looking at either running for office or wants to work in that type of a genre to be able to, to best utilize their JD degree in that manner? Great question. Here's the short answer. If you don't feel like being the perennial candidate, which means, because you're term limited out up here, you got six years in the House and you got eight years in the Senate. But if you don't feel like being the candidate, and run and, and, and facing the public, you can be a desker and you can be in the back desk shaping the policy and the law for the individual who is actually the legislator. So we have a lot of lawyers up here in Legislative Service Bureau, it's called, LSB, and they are all lawyers. They are the ones actually writing the law. They are the ones that are putting the pencil to the paper and producing the words, which is going to be spoke or written in a courtroom one day. In addition, there is policy individuals that are with the policy office up in the legislature. You don't have to be a candidate. You just have to be a lawyer who are willing to start making policy and shaping policy and the rationale as to why we need this law. And then you have the deskers, you know, the people that are doing the backroom stuff with the legislator, you know, the senator or the state representative who are actually producing not only the thought, but the willfulness of putting the words with the Legislative Service Bureau. So there's a different hat that anyone can wear if they have the law degree. And that's an expansion of where these career opportunities need to go. Because good policy, good law means a much smoother 
delivery of society in the system that we live under which is the justice system. Well, I truly appreciate you sharing that. I appreciate your time today. And I truly am looking forward to watching the policy that you create as as you continue the rest of your term and t- to watch and see where things go within the state level. That's one of the joys of working in the state capitol, but also the joys of being able to stay connected and seeing uh, a, not only a JD in action, but the uh, legislative process in action. So thank you so much for joining us today and for being a part of our show. Chris, I appreciate it. And if there's any of the students out there that want those career opportunities and or want to take part as a, like even say a intern, Tell them to contact my office. I'll be more than happy to assist them for the next jump in their careers. Well, that was another great guest this week on the Law School Insider. If you have an interest in being a guest on the show, drop me an email at lawschoolinsider at cooley, C-O-O-L-E-Y dot E-D-U. And thank you all for listening today. And remember, you have the ability and right to take control of your law school success. I hope you'll continue listening creating a plan for success that will prepare you to achieve the dreams that you have set for yourself. Talk to you next time. Thanks for listening. You're on your way to being a law school insider. Please subscribe to stay connected and come back again next time as we speak to more students, lawyers, and employers. (laughs) 